Nations. Representatives of civil society organizations, good morning. Representatives of the private sector organizations, members of the media, thank you for coming. Our virtual audience, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have uh, quite a large presentation, but let me just state that this presentation, copy of this presentation will be posted on the website of the Budget Office of the Federation, as well as on the website of the Ministry, so I will not go through every line or every page, and I want to invite you to uh, download, uh, visit the website and get a copy of this presentation. The outline of my presentation is um, to first of all give you a brief introduction and an overview of the fiscal outcomes for the 2021 uh, budget, give an update on the implementation of the 2021 budget, which by the way I'm sure you've heard by now that the capital component of the 2021 budget has been extended from December 2021 to 31st of March 2021 to improve utilization of funds that we have uh, deployed to ministries, departments, and agencies. We'll look very briefly at the global outlook and domestic developments. Also, the approach that we took to the preparation of the 2022 budget, a brief introduction of the National Development Plan, which is the basis of the budget, as well as all our fiscal plans. The underlying macroeconomic assumptions that we made, the parameters and the targets for the budget, as has been appropriated into law by the National Assembly. And also, the 2022 budget, an overview of the revenue, the expenditure, and the deficit financing. I will also be speaking to you very briefly on the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative and give you some key highlights of the 2021 Finance Act, which is uh, which is uh, designed to uh, support the implementation of the 2022 budget. Then some critical sectoral allocations in the budgets, which is uh, uh, also quite extensive, and I will advise you to look at it uh, online. And then we will be rounding up and go on to discussions, which is the reason why we're here today. So I want to remind us all that... Uh, his Excellency, Mr. President, signed the 2022 appropriation bill into law on the 31st of December, 2021. Having previously laid the uh, budget proposal before the National Assembly on the 7th of October, 2021, the President had similarly assented into law the 2021 um, budget extension, which I just spoke to, uh, to you about. And also, the, Mr. President also signed the 2021 Finance Bill, which is designed to enhance the implementation of the 2022 budget. You recall that uh, there was a supplementary budget that was passed uh, last year in July by the National Assembly and assented to, into law by the President, bringing the total uh, aggregate budget for 2021 to $14.5 uh, the 2022 appropriation bill that has been passed into law enables us to start implementation by the 1st of January 2022. And as directed by His Excellency the President, the executive arm of government will submit a request for amendment and environment to the National Assembly as soon as they resume to enable us to have some amendments done to reduce some of the impact of the changes that have been made by the National Assembly, but also to ensure that some of the legacy projects of His Excellency the President that are designed at enhancing infrastructure, promoting social inclusion, and strengthening the resilience of the economy are properly funded and, uh, and uh, we hope a lot of them will be concluded and commissioned during the lifetime of this uh, administration. Nigeria, you recall, has posted its fourth consecutive quarterly economic growth in the third quarter of 2021. 
Since the resumption of growth in the fourth quarter of 2020 and recovery from the deepest economic recession that our country has ever witnessed, real GDP grew by a record 5.01% in the second quarter of 2020, one of the biggest growth recorded by any nation across the sub-Saharan Africa uh, nation, and in fact, the highest growth recorded by our economy since 2014. Recovery was sustained by a growth of 4.03% in the third quarter of 2021, and this recovery was foiled by the implementation of government's economic sustainability plan, the ESP, as well as the easing of COVID-19 induced restrictions on economic activities. Growth in the non-oil sector has shown greater resilience, recording 5.44% in real terms during the third quarter of 2021. The growth recorded in the non-oil sector was mainly driven by trade, information, and as well as communications, specifically the telecommunications sector. Other drivers of growth in the non-oil sector include financial and insurance sector, manufacturing, that is food, beverages, uh, uh, tobacco, agricultural sector, specifically crop production, transportation and storage, including road transport. In real terms, the non-oil sector contributed 92.51% to the GDP in the third quarter of 2021, higher than the share recorded in the corresponding period in 2020 of 91.27%. Again, to restate that the Nigerian economy is truly diversified, that the oil and gas sector today contributes just around 7.5% to the Nigerian uh, economy. Nigeria's inflation rate has sustained its decline. The inflation dropped further in the month of November 2021 to 15.4% from a four-year high of 18.17% in March 2021. Urban inflation rate has also uh, 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 increased by 15.92% year-on-year in November 2021, while the rural inflation rate had increased by 14.89% in November 2021. The downward trend is expected to continue throughout the year 2022. The NBS, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, Q4 2020 estimates put unemployment at 33% and underemployment at 22.84%. High unemployment and underemployment rates have implications for poverty incidences in the population. So now let's move on to an overview of the 2021 fiscal outcomes and the update on the 2022 budget implementation. Again, let me say this is a provisional report. The 2021 um, financial year record has still been uh, updated and reconciled, so this is not the final fiscal report. The performance indicators of the budget, uh, as shown on the table in the screen before you, shows that the oil price benchmark, the actual oil price benchmark as at November 2021, was $79.31 per barrel. This is against a budgetary provision of $40 per barrel. Oil production, on the other hand, recorded a dip of 1.56 million barrels per day in November as against 1.86 million barrels per day that we uh, planned for in the 2021 budget. Exchange rate was at the NIFEX rate at 4.410 naira, 15 kobo. Inflation was 15.4% as of November, and the growth rate that we expected to achieve at the end of 2021 is 3%, but in actual fact, the third, the third quarter report of 2021 was 4.03%, and we do hope that we'll be able to reach this 3% at the, when we see the, the last quarter 2021 report. So at slide 11 is an update on the revenue performance of the 2021 budget. The fiscal numbers again are preliminary and will be updated as the reconciliation process is not yet concluded. As at November 2021, 
Federal government's aggregate revenue was 5.51 trillion. This represents 74% of the prorated target. The federal government share of oil revenues was 970.3 billion, representing 53% performance prorated target for the oil and gas revenues. Federal government share of non-oil tax revenues totaling 1.62 trillion, representing 118.8% over and above the prorated target. This is contributed to by the company income tax and value added tax collections of 718.58 billion and 360.56 billion, representing 115% and 165% respectively of the prorated targets. Customs revenue was 542.11 billion, representing 104% of the prorated target. This is just to reaffirm that the non-oil sector of the Nigerian economy uh, is growing very well, and that the larger proportion of revenues in Nigeria today is contributed by the non-oil sector. Other revenues amounting to 2.8 trillion of which federal government independent revenue contributed 1.10 uh, trillion while so this is trillion while government owned enterprise revenues was 1.2 sorry 1.10 billion while government owned enterprise revenue is 1.2 trillion this is what the dg budget mentioned that for the first time we have been able to cross the uh, 1 trillion mark in terms of independent revenues. And we expect more per better performance even in 2022. So slide 12 is just um, a table showing the line by line revenue items. I advise that you should visit this and look at it more closely. At slide 13 is an update on the expenditure performance. On the expenditure side, 12.56 trillion, representing 94.1%, has been spent out of the 13.57 trillion prorated uh, target of the budget. This is prorated as at November 2021. This performance is inclusive of expenditure estimates of government-owned enterprises, but excludes project tied loans, because we're still reconciling the numbers for the project tied loans. Of this expenditure, 4.2 trillion was uh, expended for debt service, 3.02 trillion for personnel costs, including pensions, and as at November 2021, 3.4 trillion had been expended for capital expenditure. Of this, 2.98 trillion represents 83% provision of the ministries, departments, and agencies' capital, while 369.9 billion is from multilateral bilateral project tied loans as well as 49.52 billion uh, government owned enterprises capital expenditure. So slide 14 shows you a bit more detail on the line by line expenditure items. And at slide 15 is some information on the deficit and deficit financing. So the fiscal deficit that we had projected for in the 2021 budget was 6.449 uh, trillion. And as at January to November, 5.911 trillion has been expended. Sorry, is, is the prorated component. And within that period, that is again January to November, the actual fiscal balance was 7.052 trillion. This represents an expenditure, sorry, a deficit way higher by 1.14 trillion than what we had planned in the budget for 2021. The financing for this budget included funding that has been realized from multilateral bilateral project tied loans, as well as funding from borrowings, including domestic and foreign borrowing. So now we move to an update on the global outlook and domestic development um, for the year 2022. 
So the global economy is projected to grow by 5.9% in 2021 and 4.9% in 2022. The euro area is projected to grow by 5% in 2021. China's economy is projected to pick up to up to 8% in 2021 and then has a dip to 5.4% in 2022. In Africa, the economic activities in sub-Sahara Africa region are expected to pick up in 2021 and 2022, albeit unevenly, and the, the proportions are 3.7% and 3.8%. I say unevenly because the growth rates across the countries are, are different. But despite the adverse effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, Egypt grew at 3.6% uh, in 2020, owing to the high domestic consumption that Egypt has. And they have been able to really capture those consumptions. Real GDP growth for Egypt is expected to hit 5.3% in 2022. South Africa is projected to recover from a decline of minus 6.4% and grow by 5% in 2021 and 2.2%. 2 .2%. So again, you'll notice a dip in 2022, and that's the pattern globally. Nigeria's economy posted a 4.03% year-on-year growth at the third quarter of 2021, signaling sustained economic recovery. The non-oil sector is a significant contributor to this recovery. The IMF has revised Nigeria's uh, GDP growth uh, forecast upwards from 2.6% and 2.7% in 2021 and 2022, respectively. So the previous forecast was 2.5 and 2.6. The new forecast is 2.6 and 2.7. That's by the IMF. So at slide 18, it's just still further information regarding the global GDP. I advise you to look at that at your spare time. And then now let's talk about the approach that we took for the 2022 budget. The 2022 budget seeks to continue the reflationary policies of 2020 and 2021 budgets, which helped put the economy back on the path of recovery and growth. The 2022 budget was prepared taking into consideration the policies, strategies contained in the 2022 to 2024 medium term expenditure framework and the fiscal strategy paper. The budget was prepared using the zero based budgeting approach and in line with government's development priorities as articulated in the new national development plan 2021 to 2025. Allocations to ministries, departments, and agencies were guided by the core objectives of the plan. At slide 21 is just to give you a short highlight of the 2021 to 2025 National Development Plan. So there are three thematic areas. The first is accelerating growth. Second is deepening the initiatives to diversify growth in the Nigerian economy, and the third is to foster sustainable development. The plan has an investment size of 368 trillion naira, and this will be funded by the federal government, the state government, as well as the private sector. For the investment size, the expected financial contribution is 49.7 trillion to be contributed by uh, the government, the federal and the state government. The subnational government's contribution will be 20.1 trillion, while the federal government contribution is 29.6 trillion. But the story really is in the contribution of the private sector. We are projecting that the private sector needs to contribute 293.3 trillion over this five year development plan period. And what this means to us as governments is that we must do everything that we can to support the private sector to succeed, to be able to expand their businesses and expand the size of money in terms of investments within the Nigerian economy. So the 2022 federal government budget is the first key public sector contributor to the implementation of this plan. At slide 22 is 
to show you the vision of the plan, which is to be a country that has unlocked its potentials in all sectors of the economy for sustainable, holistic, inclusive, and national development. And also, the mission will be to guide, is to guide the implementation of programs and policies that promote rapid multi-sectoral growth and development of the Nigerian economy. And then there are three pillars, as indicated in the slide, and I hope that you have fine, fine time to look at it. Again, at slide 23, is the sectoral composition of the National Development Plan. So you see the pillar of the economic growth and development, the infrastructure pillar, which includes transport power, including alternative power, housing and urban development, digital economy, science and technology, and the financial sector. You have public administration, human capital development, including education and human resources, health, food, and nutrition, the social development sector, regional development sector, as well as <clears throat> the plan implementation and the plan monitoring and evaluation. So next, we move on to the underlying macroeconomic assumptions, parameters, and targets that have been set in the 2022 Appropriation Act. The key assumptions in the 2022 Appropriation Act are, first of all, an oil production number of 1.88 million barrels per day, an oil price benchmark of $62 per barrel, an exchange rate of 410 naira, 15 kobo to one US dollar, an inflation rate of 13%, a nominal consumption of 119.29 trillion, and a nominal GDP of 184.39 trillion and a GDP growth of 4.20%. At slide 26, it's to explain to you some of the assumptions that we made. First of all, on the crude oil production. So although Nigeria's total production capacity is 2.5 million barrels per day, current year to date, crude oil production, and this is as at November, is 1.4 million barrels per day, slightly short of the OPEC quota and the OPEC, uh, the OPEC production quota that has been set for Nigeria. But there's also an additional 300,000 barrels per day of condensates, which brings the total production to 1.6 million barrels per day. The Energy Information Administration, EIA, expects that the global oil production will increase to match rising levels of glo global oil consumption. OPEC crude production is projected to average 28.34 million barrels per day in 2022, higher than the 26.94 million barrels per day in 2021. This means Nigeria will end up with a higher OPEC production quota. The National Assembly had maintained the proposed volume of 1.88 million barrels per day, including condensates, in the 2022 budget. And this means that the executive and the legislature must push the oil and gas sector to attain these production volumes, despite the fact that there was a slump in November, October and November. We understand that production has picked up to almost 1.8 million barrels per day in December. Exchange rate uh, has been uh, fixed at NAFEX rate, which is 410.15 Naira to the US dollar and this is the CBM NAFEX rate. We project our oil base price at $57 per barrel in 2022, and this was done in consultation with NMPC and other stakeholders. And, and this projection, when we sent the proposal to the National Assembly, was premised on the average focus of leading financial institutions factors driving the market fundamentals, global economic recovery, as well as plans by government and market sentiments. However, the National Assembly, reviewing the performance of the um, global crude oil price, had adjusted the price from $57 per barrel to $62 per barrel. And they had discussed with us their reasoning for that, and we agreed that it was um, a reasonable adjustment to make. 
The World Bank forecasts that crude oil prices will average $74 per barrel in 2022 as oil demand strengthens and reaches pre-pandemic levels. And also the EIA expects Brent prices to average $70.05 per barrel. So these are the reasons why the National Assembly thought it was expedient to increase the crude oil price to $62 per barrel. At slide 28, consumption is projected to increase globally uh, or oh, sorry, consumption in the Nigerian economy is expected to pick up by 9.36% um, to 149.35 trillion in 2022. Nominal GDP is projected to rise to 168.80 trillion in, 2020, from, in 2021 to 184.34 trillion in 2022. The real GDP, as I reported earlier on, we have pegged at 4.2%, and inflation. While it will continue to be double digit, our projection is it will continue to decline throughout 2022. So if we move on now to an overview of the revenue and the expenditure, as well as the deficit financing of the new 2022 Appropriation Act. At slide 30. The projected aggregate revenue available to fund the 2022 budget of 10.74 trillion, inclusive of GOEs, is 32% higher than the 2021 projected revenue of 8.1 trillion. So without the government-owned enterprises retained revenue, the federal government uh, return revenue will be 9.01 trillion. To promote fiscal transparency, accountability, comprehensiveness, and allocation, uh, we have indicated for the first time in the 2022 budget uh, the allocations to TET fund. In the past, it was not previously recorded as revenue. And the budgets of 63 government-owned enterprises are fully integrated in the 2022 budget. In aggregate, 35% of the projected revenues is to come from the oil-related re sources, while 65% is to be earned from the non-oil uh, sources. Again, this is underscoring the fact that government revenues now are largely from the non-oil sector of the Nigerian economy. As slide 31 is an overview of the revenue framework, showing you what was passed by the National Assembly in the 2021 budget, including the supplementary budget, the aggregate um, uh, revenues uh, at 6.77 trillion. Again, what is passed by the National Assembly in the 2022 budget, the aggregate of 9.012 trillion revenues. So there's a variance and improvement uh, of 2.239 trillion. And this improvement is coming from both the oil as well as the um, non-oil sectors revenue generations. At slide 32 is an overview of the expenditure framework in the 2022 budget. The 2022 aggregate federal government expenditure, including government-owned enterprises, project tied loans, is projected to be 17.13 trillion. This is 18% higher than the 2021 budget. The recurrent non-debt spending is estimated to be 16.91 trillion, and this is 40% of the total expenditure and 30% higher than the provision in the 2021 budget. The aggregate capital expenditure is 5.96 trillion. This is 35% of the total expenditure of the budget. Again, this provision is inclusive of capital component of statutory transfers, government-owned enterprises, as well as project tied loan expenditures. At 3.61 trillion, debt service is 21% of the total expenditure of the 2022 budget. And it is 34% of the projected revenue of the 2022 budget. Provisions to retire maturing bonds to local contractors and suppliers has been made in the budget in the sum of 290.71 billion, and this represents 1.6% uh, of the total expenditure. This provision is in line with federal government's commitment to offset accumulated areas of contractors' obligations dating back over a decade. 
So our slide 33 is a table that shows you an overview of the expenditure framework showing the first line statutory transfer, um, which is to national assembly, judiciary, and other agencies of government that are on first line charge. It was in the 2021 budget, the provision was 496 billion. In the 2022 budget, the provision has gone up by 373 uh, billion to 869 billion. Debt service has uh, also increased by 484 uh, billion in the 2022 budget compared to 2021. And um, the aggregate expenditure of the budget has also gone up by 700 and 72 billion to five, uh, uh, compared to 2021, to 5.961 uh, trillion naira. At slide 34 is some information on the overall deficit and the financial ratios relating to the budget. So the overall deficit is placed at 6.39 trillion for 2022. This represents 3.46% of the gross domestic project. Again, this is 0.46% higher than what has been permitted in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which is 3%. Again, both the National Assembly, the Executive, as well as Mr. President, have agreed that the economy is still in some form of an emergency and crisis mode, a combination of the impact of recession that we are exiting from, and also the security situation that we have at hand that requires very extensive uh, spending. The budget deficit is going to be financed by domestic borrowing, as well as uh, for borrowing from for foreign sources, but also multilateral and bilateral loan draw drawdowns of 1.16 trillion, and privatization proceeds of 90.7 so the ratios indicated here is showing you the proportion of, uh, of um, government deficit to capital expenditure. So capital expenditure is at in, in 2002, uh, two, uh, so uh, 2022 budget is 45% when you compare it to non-debt expenditure. When you compare it to the aggregate, it's 35%, as I reported earlier on. But the debt service to revenue ratio, while in the budget, the projection is 34%, uh, the actual might be higher than that as the budget implementation progresses. And you can see that the deficit, of, the deficit to revenue ratio is already high at 5.9%. So at slide 35 is just for me to restate that the debt level of the federal government of Nigeria is still within sustainable limits. Borrowings are essentially done for capital expenditure as well as human capital development as specified in the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2007. But having witnessed two consecutive uh, economic recessions. We have had to spend our way out of recession, which contributed significantly to the growth of the public debt. It is unlikely that our recovery from each of the past two recessions will have been as fast without the sustained government expenditure funded largely by debt. At slide 36. So to compound matters, the country has technically been facing significant security challenges across the nation. This has necessitated massive expenditure on security equipments and operations, contributing to the fiscal deficit. So defense and security sector accounts for 22% of the total 2021 uh, budget. Nigeria's deficit to GDP ratio, which is um, which is minus 4.3% as of November 2021, and deficit to and debt to GDP ratios 30% as of September 2021, are still the lowest amongst the leading 
economies in Africa today. However, Nigeria's debt service to revenue ratio at 76% as at November 2021 is the highest amongst the African top economies. This is proof that we have, what we have is not a classic debt sustainability problem, but a very significant revenue challenge. Tax rates and compliance ratios are significantly higher in these comparator countries. For instance, Nigeria's VAT rate is 7.5%. And it is the lowest in Africa today, and less than 50% of the average rate in Africa today. And that is to say that the average rate of GDP in Africa today is 15%, and we're still at 7.5%. At slide 37, it's an overview of Nigeria's debt sustainability. The impact on Nigeria's debt structure has been contained from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the crude oil prices that uh, the crash in the crude oil prices that happened in the year 2020. Nigeria maintains one of the lowest debt to GDP ratios compared to its peers. And if you look at the, the bar chart on the left hand side, you see Nigeria at 21.6%, Angola is showing there, Egypt at 19.2%, Ghana at 17%, South Africa at 77%, and others. On the, on the right hand side is the increased debt service cost to revenue ratio. And we're reporting this to again emphasize that we must all collectively work to increase revenue. You will see that at 2016, the, uh, and, and consistently from 2016 right through to 2020, except for, 20, uh, except for 20, uh, to 2018, the margins are very tight. They're very tight. So we have to work towards increasing revenue. So at 3.34%, at, uh, that is the debt service amount, while the actual revenue is, is at 3.9%. So it's a very difficult situation to manage when debt service is eating up uh, most of our revenues. We also have been working to rebalance the optimal, to re, re, reach some kind of a better mix of our external to domestic um, revenue uh, portfolio. So this chart, the bottom chart at slide 37, shows you the current mix at 61% for domestic and 38% for external borrowing. And then the chart on the right-hand side shows you the shift towards longer tenured uh, maturities, which means less debt service uh, obligations, but stretched over a longer period. And the ratio we've been able to attain uh, so far to date is 86.92%. Uh, uh, sorry, 86.2%, uh, that is long maturities, and 13.8% shorter maturities. This take, took a lot of work by the Debt Man Management Office to do this rebalancing, and it's providing us some relief on the go. At slide 38, again, it's just to restate that the efforts were were we're working on is to fix our revenue challenges because cutting expenditure is currently not a viable option as our public expenditure to GDP ratio is also one of the lowest today amongst African leading economies. We must, however, continue to rationalize our expenditures. We cannot afford waste. In reality, our largest expenditure items are currently personal cost as well as debt service and then capital expenditure which between them account for 85% of the 2022 budget. So there's little scope right now to cut this, apart from the fact that the most viable option to our physical challenge remains to grow our revenues and to plug leakages. Our target over the medium term is to grow our revenue to GDP ratio from the current 8 9% to 15% by the year 2025 and at the levels of uh, revenue, and at that level of revenue when we reach the 15% ratio, the debt service to revenue ratio will cease to be a concern for us as a nation. 
the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative, the SRGI, and other ongoing initiatives are plans to address this, and we're seeing positive results already. So again, let me remind us of what the SRGI is. The Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative is a revenue, uh, is, is an initiative that is designed to address our revenue uh, challenges. It, it is a systematic resource mobilization problem that we must address. The several measures that we have designed and encapsulated into the SRGI are designed to improve government revenues, entrench fiscal prudence with emphasis on achieving value for money. These measures include improving tax administration frameworks, including compliance for tax filing and payment compliance improvements. Other measures encapsulated in the SRGI include the evaluation of the processes and policy effectiveness of uh, federal government incentives, also a review of sector sectors that are eligible for pioneer tax holiday incentives under EDITRA, dimensioning the cost of tax waivers, concessions, and evaluating their policy effectiveness, setting annual ceilings for tax expenditures to better manage their impact on the already constrained government revenues, ensuring that MDAs appropriately account for and remit their IGRs, their internally generated revenues. At slide 42, there are some other measures contained in the SRGI which are, which, are, which are identifying and blocking existing revenue leakages to enhance compliance and reduce tax evasion, leveraging technology and automation, and plugging fiscal drainers like subsidies. Further enhancement uh, measures for independent revenue uh, collection has also been built into the SRGI, and government aims to optimize the operational efficiencies and the revenue generation focus of the government enterprises. We've also introduced new and further increases in existing pro-tax, pro-health taxes, for example, excise duties on carbonated drinks. At slide 43, is just to show you a picture of the improvement in the independent revenues. As reported earlier by the DG budget, if you look at the performance from 2017 and 200, at 216 billion, now up to 1.1 trillion in 2021. What did we do? In the 2020 Finance Act, we made a provision that requires that all government enterprises have pegged their expenditure to revenue ratio at 50%, which means as a GOE, you cannot spend more than 50% of the revenue that you generate. And that's why we have this, this spike. As at November, we have surpassed uh, the collection targets that has been set in the 2021 budget. And for the first time, we have passed the 1 trillion Naira collection mark of independent revenues at 1.04 trillion uh, as against what was budgeted for the year, which is 973.41 billion. Analysts have always considered our projections unrealistic, but we've always insisted that the potentials exist to grow federal government revenue. It was just a question of finding the best way to harness those revenues. So now, I would like to speak to the forum about some of the key highlights in the Finance Act 2021, which is an instrument that is designed to enhance the implementation of the 2022 budget. Again, recall that Mr. President signed the Finance Act into law on the 31st of December 2021, alongside the 2022 Appropriation Act. The key reform areas amended by the Finance Act uh, um, include domestic revenue mobilization, tax administration and legislative drafting, drafting, international taxation, financial sector reforms and tax equity, as well as public financial management reform. So there are up to about 13 laws that have been amended by the Finance Act 2021, and this include the Capital Gains Tax Act, Company Income Tax Act, Customs Excise Tariff Act, uh, Tariff Act Consolidated, Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act, Personal Income Tax, Stamp Duties Act, 
Tertiary Education Tax Act, Value Added Tax Insurance Act, Nigerian Police Trust Fund Act, the Nasani Act, Financial Controls and Management Act, as well as the Fiscal Responsibility Act. The key critical policy trusts of the Finance Act 2021 are five, and the first is domestic revenue mobilization. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Section two of the Finance Act addressed the issue of the partial rollback of exemption of shares from capital gains tax. So now the law has stipulated a 10% capital gains tax imposed on shares disposal transactions when the aggregate disposal exceeds 100 million naira in any 12 consecutive calendar months. And also, the reinvestment relief provided along with this tax to, is provided to default capital gains tax where disposal proceeds are wholly or partially reinvested. So if you invest and the proceeds, you realize the proceeds of investments and you invest them, you are not going to um, so far, the 10% capital uh, gains tax. But if you don't reinvest and you exit and take your money, then you pay this tax. Taxpayers are required to report disposals annually for ease of administration to the FIRS, uh, for corporate tax shareholders, and to the state and land revenues for individual taxpayers. At Section 17 of the Finance Act, we have made, uh, there is a law now that has imposed duty on non-alcoholic carbonated sweetened beverages. So there's now an excise duty of 10 naira per liter imposed on all non-alcoholic carbonated and sweetened beverages. And this is designed to, one, discourage excessive consumption of sugar in beverages, which contributes to a number of health conditions, including diabetes and obesity, but also this new sugar tax in, is introduced to raise excise duties and revenues for health-related issues and other critical expenditures. This is in line also with the 2022 uh, budget priorities. The next slide is um, the Finance Act as Section Eight is, has made provisions to, relating to the FIRS automation and ICT reforms. The mechanism here is to enable FIRS to sanction non-compliant taxpayers that are refusing the, uh, the, the FIRS access to their IT systems. FIRS is also authorized to deploy propriety and third-party uh, technology applications to collect information from taxpayers. The rationale behind this is to enhance the ongoing ICT and tax administration reforms by the FIRS to increase revenue generation also in line with the objectives and priorities of the 2022 budget. As section 21 is also provisions imposed on FIRS itself on taxpayers' confidential data so that there is enhanced confidentiality or non-disclosure by FIRS and its staff of taxpayers' confidential data. So they have access to IT systems, but they are also uh, required to keep priority information of taxpayers confidential. And there are steep penalties that have been provided in the law to penalize FIRS staff for breaches of, non, uh, for breaches of uh, confidentiality of taxpayers' data. Next slide is uh, section four of the act, which is taxation of e-commerce businesses by non-resident companies on a fair and reasonable turnover basis, which has been set at 6% of turnover. This provision empowers FRS to access non-resident firms, to assess non-resident firms to tax on fair and reasonable basis of turnover and from digital services provided to Nigerian customers. This also is introducing turnover tax on fair and reasonable percentage of profits and from providing digital services to Nigerian customers. Let me just note that such digital services include apps, high frequency trading, electronic data storage, online advertising, and several others. 
The rationale for this is to modernize the taxation of ICT and digital economy in line with current realities. And this is in conformity with the provisions of the National Development uh, Plan of 2021-2025. As Section 30, 10, 31, and 14 of the Finance Act designed to uh, amend some provisions, sorry, Section 30 of the Finance Act designed to amend Section 10 uh, of VAT as well as Section 31 and 14 of VAT. It's in relation to VAT obligations of non-digital resident companies. And the mechanism that will be used is to restrict VAT obligations mainly to digital non-resident companies who supply individuals in Nigeria who cannot themselves self-account for VAT. So if you visit Amazon, we're expecting Amazon to add a VAT charge to whatever transaction you're paying. We're going to, um, I'm using Amazon as an example. We're going to uh, be working with Amazon to agree to be registered as a tax agent for the FIRS. So Amazon will now collect this payment and remit to FIRS. And this is in line with global best practice. We'll be missing out on these revenue streams. We are also uh, looking at reducing tax compliant burdens on non-resident taxpayers who are not required to register for VAT. So they don't really have to come and be registered companies in Nigeria. All they need is that uh, arrangement with FRS where they collect VAT on, on behalf of FRS and remit to FRS. And also to clarify that FRS may appoint persons including non-resident companies for the purpose of VAT collection. And to clarify again, the appointed persons may collect and remit taxes to FRS uh, pursuant to the relevant tax laws. The whole rationale for this is to modernize the taxation of ICT and digital economy in line with uh, the, the National Development Plan to enhance administrative modalities of taxation of non-resident taxpayers and also to reduce compliance on the non-resident taxpayers to reduce the compliance border. Section three of the Finance Act has made some provisions on securities lending reforms, uh, which, which are currently led by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the securities lending permits lenders to receive compensation uh, from securities lending trading. It was not like this before, so now uh, traders can actually receive a compensation for securities lending trading. And the rationale is tax equity to enable security lending reforms that have been championed by FIRS in line with the uh, uh, National Development Plan. Section 14 of the Act is on real estate investments, again reforms led by, the, uh, by SEC. And to clarify that withholding taxes deducted from unit trust dividends are final taxes on unit trust. And to clarify also that real estate investment trusts are special tax uh, regime provisions apply to REITS set up as unit trust schemes. Again, the essence is tax equity in support of sex uh, current real, uh, uh, real estate investment trust and unit trust financial sector reforms. As section 33 of the Finance Act 33, 34, and 35 is provisions relating to insurance companies' capitalization of the national uh, reforms that is being undertaken currently by the National Insurance Corporation. This is amending the Insurance Act. Enhancing, so the mechanism will be to enhance the definition of share capital, also what is share capital requirement, and determine the minimum capital to enhance NIACOM's recapitalization reforms. I'm sure you know that there's this recapitalization reforms that have been going on for a long time, and there's lack of clarity in the Insurance Act. This provision is providing that clarity. And also, this will enhance tax equity in support of the insurance sector reforms. A section 22 of the Finance Act is, it reinforces the Federal Enrolled Revenue Service mandate as the principal tax collection agency. Currently, we have so many agencies, including some law enforcement agencies, that go about doing tax audits, go about raising tax assessment on companies, making the ease of doing business really complex for businesses. 
So this is to reinforce the lead role of the FIRS and to confirm that the FIRS is the principal tax re revenue collection agency and that they may collaborate with other law enforcement agencies of government to enhance tax collection. 0.25% levy on profit before tax on major companies turnover exceeding 100 uh, million, equal to or exceeding 100 million in the banking sector, in the oil and gas sector, in the maritime sector, in the aviation sector, in the telecom sector, as well as ICT sectors. This provision also empowers FRS to collect on behalf of Neseni this levy. This increased funding will accrue to a special Naseni account to fund budgetary expenditure targeted on nurturing a dynamic science and engineering sector in our country. The new changes that have been brought in is to enhance tax administration and also to ensure the growth of the science and technology sector of our country. Sections 38 and 39 of the Act also reiterates the supremacy of the fiscal rules that are provided in the 1999 Constitution as amended and other exempt money uh, acts in public financial management. The, the, the purpose is to reiterate and reinforce the 1999 Constitution as well as the Finance Control and Management Act provisions vis-a-vis -vis management of public finances and collection of revenue. So simply put, is to ensure that all revenues that are collected will go first of all, as defined by the Constitution, into the Consolidated Revenue Fund, and whichever agency has any levies or taxes will be paid from there. So first to the pool, and then you're paid from there. The payment could be on first line charge, but first the monies are generated into the pool. This will enhance public financial management reforms. It will also uh, help us to reduce revenue leakages and help us to better manage actual expenditure and ensure enhanced revenue performance. So at slide 51, this administration is committed to accelerating post-COVID-19 economic recovery through the National Development Plan. Is this, uh, the National Development Plan has been designed to stimulate inclusive, diversified, and sustainable economic growth to support private sector uh, participation and productivity as well as competitiveness, to create productive employment and preserve jobs, to ensure macroeconomic stability, promote poverty reduction, and more equitable world wealth creation. So accelerating strategic revenue generation initiatives through the SRGR and also through the instruments of the annual finance bills will help Nigeria to continue to diversify its revenue uh, base to ensure annual tradition of finance acts that accompany the annual budgets that it will help us to maximize public financial management. While ongoing reforms are uh, Still work, uh, are still working in the oil and gas sector. The non-oil sector also is producing real and tangible results. And there remains significant gaps that we still continue to work on to bridge our revenue challenges. The Finance Act 2021 for the 2022 fiscal year is enacted and it has provided significant tax, fiscal and other reforms to drive domestic revenue mobilization. There will be more fiscal reforms and measures that might be required during the course of the year, and uh, we will continue to, to deal with the emerging fiscal constraints and challenges as the year uh, rolls on. This administration is committed to continuous dialogue and robust engagement with all stakeholders, key stakeholders, in respect of all the fiscal reforms that we are undertaking. So, to the final segment of this presentation, which is presenting some of the critical sectoral allocations in the 2022 budget. Starting with the education sector, you can see that we have made an aggregate provision of 1.23 trillion naira, and this is contributed by the provisions made to the main ministry and its agencies, 815, 
to UBEC, the Universal Basic Education Trust Fund, 112.29 billion, and to TET Fund at 306.00 billion. Next is the provisions that we made for the health sector. The health sector has an aggregate provision of 876.38 billion. This represents 5.1% of the federal government budget. The total provision of 770.87 billion has been made for the ministry and its agencies. There's also 49.37 billion that has been made for immunization, including counterpart funding for donor supported programs, including the global uh, support by Global Fund and Gavi. And also the transfer that we make routinely of 1% of the consolidated revenue fund to the basic health care provision fund. At slide 55, is provisions again made to the defense and the security sector at 2.29 trillion, representing 13.4% of the budget for 2022. This is provisions made for the military, the police, the intelligence agencies, as well as the paramilitary services. We also made a provision of 1.42 trillion, representing 8.3% of the budget for infrastructure. This is provisions made for the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing, but also the Ministries of Power, Transport, Water Resources, and Aviation. Social Development and Poverty Reduction got a provision of 462 uh, billion. This is for the social investment program as well as the poverty reduction programs of government. So if you go to the website, you'll find more details of some of the provisions. We could not take all of them uh, in this uh, presentation. The 2022 budget is expected to further accelerate the recovery of our economy. The budget reflects the key execution priorities and strategies defined in the National Development Plan. Government will continue to create an enabling environment for the private sector to increase their investments and contribute more significantly to job creation, to economic growth, and to lifting millions of our citizens out of poverty. The early passage of the 2022 budget for implementation from 1st of January 2022 will significantly contribute towards achieving government's macro, fiscal, and sectoral objectives. However, revenue currently remains our main fiscal challenge. Government remains committed to effective implementation of the strategic revenue growth initiatives to improve revenue collection, expenditure management, as well as fiscal sustainability. We're optimistic that our ability to finance the budget, considering the positive global oil market outlook and the continuous improvement in our non-oil revenues. We are also exploring available opportunities for public-private partnerships, concessions, as well as climate finance arrangements to fast track the uh, infrastructure development. At slide 29, and this is um, just to state that achieving government's budget objectives require collective, decisive, as well as bold and urgent action. And government is determined to act as may be required. However, government also remains committed to implementing measures aimed at moderating the unintended negative effects of policies on the citizens. Safety nets will be provided to cushion the impact of reform measures on vulnerable segments of our society. Finally, let me say, as usual, we welcome citizens' participation in enhancing budget implementation, budget monitoring via the following electronic platforms, the iMonitor that sits on the website of the Budget Office, the Citizens Budget Monitoring app, which is available for pre on Google Store. And also, we have on the website a list of some key projects in the 2022 budget. I have presented only a few of them. The details of the Federal Government of Nigeria 2022 Appropriation Act and the Finance Bill for 2021, 
are available on the website of the Federal Ministry of Finance and Budget and National Finance, as well as the Budget Office of the Federation. You will not end up with a specific uh, one single number because the creation of employment is not the subject of the federal government budget alone. Is the budgets of the federal government and the state government, but more importantly, is the activities of the private sector that creates employment. So it's not just government budgets alone. Uh, 1.4 trillion, 8.2 percent of infrastructure. What is, what is new? Again, I had kept I kept asking while I was doing my presentation that please. Um, I don't know whether we can put the last slides that were attached as appendix as we were talking, that you need to look at the details of the budget. We also have uh, some of this we selected from each sector, some projects, just to show. Our target this year is complete ongoing projects. There are very few new projects that we're trying to start. We're trying to complete ongoing projects. You ask what is new, there might be some few new things, but mostly we are concentrating on completing major infrastructure uh, projects. Mr. Benjamin Benedict. Um, so it's difficult to compare Nigeria with Sweden or Nigeria with US and Nigeria with. So if we do that, it means we'll be living in cloud nine. We just need to be realistic. We compare Nigeria with South Africa, with Egypt, with Ghana with Brazil, countries that are Malaysia, countries that are comparable to us. We are not at the same level. When we do our plans, we check the advanced economies. We check the middle income countries. We check our peers. We check also countries that we think we are a bit stronger than. So it's, it's a holistic view. And in this report, we just select uh, some global indices to report on. We select indices rel relating to the uh, uh, medium income countries. And then indices relating to the African countries, because that is what makes more real, uh, that brings, it, brings more reality to people that were. So you are from Sweden, you can appreciate that. If I'm talking to an ordinary Nigerian, I have to be comparing Nigeria with Ghana, with South Africa, for people to even understand and appreciate what we are trying to, to, to see. So it's not that we don't have high aspirations, but the aspirations also have to be moderated this is a one-year budget, and also the, uh, the plan that we have is a five-year plan. Some of these nations achieved the milestones that they have achieved over a decade, over 100 years. So Rome is not built, was not built in one day, but it's a process, and we're aspiring to do more. And also, um, you, you said we should teach our farmers how to improve productivity. A lot of that is being done. We have um, support from different clusters of development partners. Uh, the Mr. President's aspiration is to eat what we grow and consume what we produce. So everything we're doing is actually working towards that. So we're not just producing agricultural materials and, and importing raw materials, but there are, we're also um, processing the raw material so that there's value retained within the economy, even as we aspire to produce more and export better quality products uh, out of the country. Um, I have, I have, the National Population Commission has an approval to conduct national census. The initial target is for 2022. As far as I know, it is still for 2022. Uh, it could change depending on number of indicators. It could be 2023 as well. We've been funding the National Population Commission towards this census. They are almost ready. What they have to do in 2022 as the last mile walk that is going to be done. So the country is almost ready for uh, population uh, census. The determination is the selection of the dates, which will be a decision that the president will have to make on the advice of the National Population Commission. In the 2022 budget, we made a provision for first subsidy from January to June. And that means from July to December, there's no provisions that we made from first subsidy. So our assumption is that by June, will have been able to walk through a process together with all stakeholders, including the national oil company, all the regulators in the oil and gas uh, sector, 
different uh, um, key MDAs that have a role to play, as well as the businesses and labor organizations. The Petroleum Industry Act, the PIA of 2021, has made a provision that indicates that all petroleum product prices will be deregulated. And so far, um, we have been able to deregulate kerosene prices, diesel prices. The only product that is still not regulated is PMS. So we are planning to comply with the law because the PIA is an act of the National Assembly. It's a law that we all collectively have a responsibility to, to apply. But what do we do in terms of providing uh, CERCA to mitigate the impact of the removal of the first subsidy on the citizens that will need, require that support. From the Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, we had floated a proposal to say, maybe one of the things we should do is to provide a transport subsidy in the sum of 5,000 Naira, or any amount that may be later agreed, for between 20 to 40 million people there's a, a group that is meeting, chaired by His Excellency, the Vice President. So the numbers are still to be discussed and to be agreed upon. And the idea is to find a way to provide funds in the hands of the people that really need it to enable them uh, have some support because of this potential removal of first subsidy. But that's the proposal from the ministry. Since then, there has been other proposals on how to mitigate the impact of the first subsidy that has come and will be considered by this committee. So what we had and we, we put out in the public is a proposal from the ministry. It will be discussed alongside other proposals and whichever one is agreed as the one that is most practical and also the one that will be easier to implement, especially as we want to make sure only the right people get that subsidy, will be the one that will be implemented. One other proposal that has been made, which is very key, is for us to identify um, through the Transport Workers Union, commercial vehicle drivers, get them registered, and pass the subsidy through them using vouchers. So there are several options that we are currently working on. As people resume from their holidays, this committee work will restart again. And part of the uh, work will be to engage also with labor and get inputs from labor so that we're able to comply to the provisions of the, with the provisions of the uh, Petroleum Industry Act that specifies that all petroleum product prices should be uh, de deregulated. On the issue of uh, what are we doing for export expansion grants, um, there was um, a chair of Naseni that was in the meeting earlier in the day. Uh, some of the things we are doing is implementing the EEG by paying uh, for uh, paying the notes that we issue to each of the beneficiaries and. Even though we have a backlog, we have a program on how to cover those backlogs. And the country, on the military pensions, unfortunately, this morning we woke up with retired military pensioners at our gates. And the issue that was presented to us is that of the areas of minimum wage for the military pensioners which has now been provided for in the 2022 budget. So the 24 months areas will be paid by the provisions that we have made in the 2022 budget. And you can check the budget, it's in the service-wide vote. We also understand that uh, the military pensioners have been engaging with the military pensions, but so it is today that the um, team decided to come and interact with us. We have had a productive engagement with them. They have written us, we will reply them and give them our schedule for how those payments will be made during the course of the year. Leah from NTA also raised questions relating to pensions and was asking about arrangements uh, with the regulatory agencies and why can't we use technology? 
I don't want to venture into providing responses to this, except to say that I know the PENCOM, as well as PTAD, have been embracing technology and are improving on their regulatory processes. But I would like to ask both agencies to articulate a broad response in terms of what they are doing in terms of technology to enhance the response time of uh, the expectations of pensioners in the pension industry. On the exchange rate, we stick to what is provided for in the, in the Appropriation Act, that is 410 Naira, 15 Kobo to the US dollar. During the course of implementation, whenever there is uh, a rate that is higher, if the NIFEX rate is higher than the budget rate, we have an exchange rate differential that accrues to the Federation account. So the CBN actually will give us that, for, uh, that uh, uh, differential. And it is applied in fact and distributed to the three tiers of government. As to the activity of uh, RAMFAC, I will uh, uh, link you up, um, uh, Leah, with RAMFAC so that you uh, get more information on the round of activities that they have been undertaking. But I know that the primary function of RAMFAC is to monitor and mobilize revenue from within the uh, federation. Uh, that is, revenues that are relating to the federation account as distinct to, from revenue that accrue to the federal government alone. And they have been very active in this case. They have been very useful and instrumental to maximizing revenues that accrue for FAC, which we distribute on a, on a monthly basis.